I've recently been looking into the teaching of Jonathan Edwards. Um, those of you who may not know him, I, I wouldn't be surprised. He comes from the 18th century, one of the spir spiritual giants of the time. You've all probably heard, however, of sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's a timeless classic, uh, his sermon, a challenge, an inspiration to all of us. It's been said of Jonathan Edwards teaching and preaching that his doctrine is all application and his application is all doctrine. Uh, whoever made that statement meant that the man never taught doctrine in abstraction. That he always translated his teaching into practical application. And the same is just as true of his practical teaching and his preaching. He always made it the point to trace back everything to their roots in the, in the doctrine. Now, if you look carefully at the New Testament, you'll soon discover that this was a very consistent apostolic mindset. It was something that the apostles did again and again and again as they began to teach and to preach widely in the early church. Our passage today if you look at it broadly, is a classic example of that. We're concluding a second major section of First Peter today, a key section. Pastor George began to lay the foundation two Sundays ago when he taught on First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. He took us through how we are to define our identity in relation to, to Christ and in contrast to the unbeliever. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 6 says, We are living stones, each of us, being built up as a spiritual house, living stones in a house with Christ as the cornerstone. Pastor EJ completed that foundation, our identity, last Sunday by taking us through 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Once we were not the people, but now we are the people of God, it says. Well, from there, the section climactically leads up to our text today. And let's all stand. Let's, uh, as is our custom, let's read and honor the word of God as entrusted to us today. First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you, let's read this together, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray. Lord, would you honor us today by sending your word out to the people who need to hear it in this congregation. Send them out as arrows and darts to pierce their hearts, to pierce our hearts, so that we may do that which you want us to do out of all of this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want you to notice, firstly, that our text is a clear example of application that is all doctrine. It is rooted in and it seamlessly flows out of the foundational doctrine that is laid down for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. Our identity as the people of God, verse 10, becomes the basis for what we are supposed to be doing in this world. It says, that as citizens of heaven, we are aliens and strangers in this world. The words aliens and strangers are actually synonyms in the original language. And together, what they do is they give us a clear picture image of what Peter meant. The word pictures of one who might live beside you, lives in a temporary dwelling, maybe an easily dismantled house, maybe even a tent of sorts. He's a foreigner. As the old hymn goes, he's just a passing through. His loyalties, his allegiances are somewhere else, not to you or to your country. 
Now, look at how those synonyms, the aliens, aliens and strangers, are used in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 23, in verse 4. Abraham says this to the son of, sons of Heth, I am a stranger and a sojourner, he said, among you. Give me a burial site among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And as it was with Abraham, so it was with Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, verse 3. So too with Isaac's son Jacob, Genesis 28, verse 4. They too were aliens and strangers, sojourners in this world. The nation of Israel, you might remember, simply sojourned in Egypt for hundreds of years. That's what Genesis chapter 47, verse 7 tells us. Now in the New Testament, Hebrews describes Old Testament saints as aliens and sojourners. Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16, all of these died in faith without receiving promises. They were strangers and exiles on the earth, we are told. Now consider too Paul's masterful analogy in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. It is this very same thing. Life on earth, it says, is like living in a tent. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 4. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, it says, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. And again, for indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. Friends, what, what is a tent? Very simply, it's something that's meant to be temporary quarters. Try as we might to make a tent comfortable, it is still a tent, nothing more, nothing less. Even today's high-tech and marvelously equipped tents, those that come complete with chemical toilets, those that come with waterproof floors, zip-up mosquito nets, they can never be as comfortable as home. Think high-end tents, for example. Oh. Click there. And one more, please. There. Those that are designed and outfitted, sparing no expense. Tents which are as elaborate and as luxurious as this on the inside, still, they are nothing more than tents, aren't they? They will always be temporary dwellings. They will never be quite as comfortable as your real home. What is all of that saying? Just this, remember who you are. Remember that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are of a holy nation, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Remember that you are a citizen of heaven, a stranger, an alien, a sojourner in this world. Now, it doesn't get more doctrine that's all application than that. But why? Why is this all so important? Because what Peter gets into from this point on has no meaning if that's not true of you. It doesn't mean anything if you're a citizen of this world and not a citizen of heaven. Now very important to keep that in mind because our passage today introduces and succinctly preambles the third major section of First Peter. In that section, it explains how we're all supposed to live our lives today here on earth. From verses 13 of chapter 2, it runs all the way through chapter 3 and verse 7. And there are no abstractions there either. In light of our identity in Christ, the third section spells out how we are to be living our lives as citizens in 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 to 17, as employees in chapter 2, 18 to 20, as wives in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, as husbands in chapter 3, verse 7. This is all preambled in our text today. Well, let's get right into the meat of the passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Here's the first key part of that passage. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts. 
which wage war against the soul. Verse 11. I want you to notice the exact word that is used in that first part. The word is what? Abstain. That's the action word. It means to hold oneself away from something. It means exactly that. It doesn't say indulge your fleshly lusts less. It doesn't say do it less frequently. It doesn't say do it only occasionally. It clearly says stay completely away from fleshly lusts. He means to stay away from this lust in all of its forms, at all times, and in any circumstances whatsoever. Abstain, it says. Now, what exactly does it mean by fleshly lusts? Does he mean any and all of our appetites? Does it mean stay away from food? Does it mean stay away from drink, stay away from sex? What's the answer to that? Of course not. It doesn't mean that. The scripture, in fact, very clearly warns us against these don'ts that some of us are so clearly identified with as Christians. In fact, look at what 1 Timothy chapter 4 says. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, the, the Spirit it says, explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Men, it says, who forbid marriage, advocate abstaining from foods which, Christ, which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now, notice how it explicitly warns against these don'ts. These injunctions that masquerade as Christian piety. When up against this cause for higher heights of spirituality that come from denying yourself legitimate needs and the appetites you, it says, are up against what? Doctrines of demons. So, if not those, what then are these fleshly lusts exactly? Well, as I understand it, this may well be legitimate appetites, but legitimate ones that are indulged in in ways that make them forms of idolatry. And I think we all know when that happens, don't we? Appetites for food, the, when, which make one no longer a foodie, but a slave to food. No longer a wine connoisseur, but an alcoholic. No longer a fashionista, but a shopaholic. No longer just any old pastor, but a mega pastor. We all know those fleshly lusts, don't we? So, they may well be legitimate appetites that are problematically indulged in. Appetites indulged in to the, degree, to the degree that make them idols. Either that, or they may well be appetites that are explicitly declared by God as, a, as illicit. Spilt as out of bounds by God himself. An appetite for sex outside of marriage, for instance. Brother Peter Martin, he spoke of this in his introduction in late August on 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 to 16. That is the unique value proposition of that nefarious business, Ashley Madison. Illicit sex made easy. Adultery anonymous. That was the value proposition. And of course there are other forms of that, infinitely far worse forms. Same-sex immorality, for instance. In their heart of hearts, people know that sex like that is illicit. Even if you don't believe in God, you know that there's something inherently wrong with it. And that's why there's just this relentless push to legalize and to legitimize the thing. Well, duh. It can never be legitimized. Never. Whatever any government, any Supreme Court, or any Pope says, it can never be legitimized because everyone knows deep down inside that it is wrong, it is illicit. And if you indulge in it, it leaves a mark that will never leave you. Inside all of us, we know that same-sex immorality is just that. It's simply over the top. Now that's the point that John Piper, in arguing against this LGBT, 
made a point to the Supreme Court saying, you know, you, you people are trying to legitimize, to make an institution out of something that everyone knows is wrong. That's what's so wrong about that decision, he says. And guess what? God said this very same thing thousands of years back, didn't he? Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, it says, You shall not lie a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination, it says. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, If there's a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. The Apostle Paul went out of his way to make this as clear as it can be. Romans chapter 1, 24 to 27. God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also. The man abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire for one another. And mark this, in decent acts, receiving in their own persons, he says, the due penalty of this error. This is why you cannot wash this away. No matter how many years you try and push it down, it still keeps coming back. You know it's dead wrong. It just bothers you. And that's why you need to have it legitimized every which way you can. You know what, whether legitimate appetites that are problematically indulged in or explicitly out of bound ones, fleshly lusts are very clearly defined for us in First Peter in our passage. Verse 11, it says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war, wage war against the soul. Peter defines the one distinguishing characteristic of this fleshly lusts, those that wage war against the soul, he says. They that cripple the soul for, of its spiritual vigor. They that hobble the soul for its intimacy and connection with God. They that waylay the soul for prayer, for meditation, and tragically for timely recognition of spiritual danger. Not, note that this says too that this fleshly lusts Wage war, it says. Peter says the enemy doesn't wait outside the walls trying to starve you out. They don't just lie there waiting for your, your soul to cave in, to capitulate, to surrender. Now these lusts are pictured as troops that are furiously attacking, battering down the soul. They wage war against the soul, it says. And by the way, that's in the present tense, as in constantly waging war. This is a picture of relentlessly attacking hostiles, bent on taking you down one way or another. Now we can see why it was so important that Peter should remind us who we are, what we are in Christ before he got into any of this. You see, Peter is a realist. He knows fully well that these lusts remain in us. He knows fully well they're vestiges of the old self, remnants that stem from the old nature. And the Apostle Paul himself plaintively records his own struggle with them in Romans chapter 7. You know that, uh, that passage where it says, Evil is present in me. Sin, he says, which is in my members. But the Apostle Peter also addressed this very point, didn't he? This fleshly lusts wage war against the soul. He says in, in chapter 2 verse 11. But this he also said in 1 Peter 1. In verses 22 to 23, since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, he says. You remember? We took that up. And there's that key point again, my friends. Our identity in relation to Christ and in contrast to the unbeliever. Just like everybody else, we have the same lusts in our members. Just like everybody else, we are subject to their constant and relentless attack. But there is one crucial difference, one very, very crucial difference. Our souls were purified, purified by the blood of Christ himself. Our souls were purified by the Son. Our souls are being purified and continue to be purified by his Spirit every single day that we remain in this world. 
And so though our souls are relentlessly under attack, they're constantly besieged by this fleshly lust, we have in us all that we need to slay this lust and to live as we must. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and to godliness, it says. Now, let's turn to what Peter has been very carefully leading up to through here in verse 12. It says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in this thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. Now there are several principles that jump out of the text right there. Our time together, however, is limited, so I will take you through what I consider to be the most important ones. You'll have to ask your group leaders to take you through the rest. Firstly, spirituality must come from the inside out. Spirituality from the inward parts, stemming from our very souls, is the foundation of external spirituality. Here in 1 Peter, the principle is evident from the way Peter has deliberately sequenced all of this. Peter deals with both the internal as well as external spirituality here in these two verses. But notice that he first dealt with internal spirituality in verse 11. And only when he had finished that off did he get into external spirituality in verse 12. Now Peter really gets into this in the next section. Like, for example, when he addresses the wives in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, it says, Let your adornment not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing good jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, precious in the sight of God. Now, I'm frequently accused of picking on the wives and being easy on the husbands. I just want to remind you that Peter said that I didn't, okay? If that bothers you, take it up with him. Okay. Now, interestingly, this principle, this key principle, spirituality from the inside out, was completely lost on the spiritual leaders of that time. They had only the pretense of external spirituality. On the inside, they were rotten and drew Jesus' strongest contempt, if you'll notice. Matthew 23, 25 to 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you deal with the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, it says, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like wash, whitewashed tombs. On the outside you look beautiful, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Those of us who are given leadership positions should have all of that etched in brass. Then we should place them on a plate prominently so that we should see it where we work again and again as, as we do that every day. Now EJ I hear has a skull at his work desk. I don't know if he's told you that yet last week, maybe I wasn't here, but you should ask him about it the next time he speaks. Why a skull? I hear Jaja doesn't feel very nicely about that, so you, maybe you should ask him. As for me, you know, I've thrown away, well, I've, I've re actually mothballed all my diplomas, all my medals, all my trophies, my tombstones for my career. This brass plate featuring Matthew 23, 25 to 27, will soon replace them all on a brass plate. And I'll, I'll put that where I work, so I'll never forget it. Second important principle. Our spirituality is not only to be private, but public. How often have you heard and said with total conviction, my religious beliefs are a very personal thing? Translated, leave me alone. My faith is private. Well, surprise, Jesus never gave us the option of a strictly personal faith. It says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Notice that? Among the Gentiles. We have to be right there among them, among the ungodly, among the citizens of this world who do not know any better. We are to be right there and our lives are to be public. 
available to be observed. Now it's a very interesting word, observed. It's a word that you can find only here and in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 2, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that if they are disobedient, they may be won over without a word, it says, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. The word literally means scrutinize. Scrutinize what? Your excellent behavior, it says. And that makes it doubly meaningful. Because it comes right after they slander you as evildoers. The contrast between what they say to you and what they observe when they shut up. You know, and look at what you're doing, what, look at your life. It's supposed to lead those very same people toward the Lord. Very important principle. And it doesn't get any clearer than that in Matthew chapter 5. In verses 14 to 16, you remember, you were there for years. You are the light of this world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp, it says, and put it under the peck measure. But on the lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Jesus did not oppose demonstrating righteousness before men. What he opposed was the public display of ritual, prayer, fasting, almsgiving. The very things that Christians have come to be known for, rituals. Again and again, Jesus rebuked acts of self-righteousness. Those acts performed before men to gain their praise and not the praise of God. No, Jesus called his disciples to live out his righteousness out in the open, to be observed in our daily lives. Now, a third and very, very important principle, living as we should doesn't mean we'll always be praised or may not even be praised for doing so. It, it appears from here. Why? Because righteousness, it provokes a variety of responses. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 implies that living a godly life may result in drawing some to the faith. 1 Peter chapter 3, in verses 10 to 12 says, doing that may well bring a favorable response. But chapter 2 verse 12 says, it, will, it might also provoke the opposite. Peter says we should expect the ungodly to slander us. Third principle, prepare to be slandered. Again, read what it says. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as, un, as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God. The text directly addresses the slander that was heaped on the Christians then. It's fascinating, actually, to study this through. They accused them of all kinds of things. They accused them of insurrection. They said they were guilty of rebelling against the Roman government and against all human authority. They said they were disloyal to Caesar, and because of that, uh, the, that was because they refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord and would not offer incense to his images. And because they were freeing up slaves, they were accused of wrecking homes, of damaging trade and social progress. And amazingly enough, they were accused of atheism. Can you imagine that, Christians being accused of atheism? They did that because they wouldn't worship the Roman emperors who claimed to be gods. They wouldn't worship any of the lesser Roman gods either. They accused them of cannibalism. You know, they said that one of their delicacies was human flesh, that they killed and ate their children at their feasts. They accused them of immorality, and, and that was almost laughable. Laughable because they accused them of practicing incest, disgusting immorality that ironically was routinely pra practiced by the Roman ruling classes of the time. Now, I don't know if any of you are keeping an ear tuned to the ongoing political skirmishing that's happening in the United States. Uh, I imagine not very many Filipinos do that. After all, we have our own burlesque shows here, like last night with another announcement for somebody who's running for vice president. You know, but there are some recent developments, uh, interesting developments in the USA race. It involves Ben Carson, one of the Republican front runners. Carson was number two in the polls behind Donald Trump. 
Coming into that much, much publicized Republican candidates, candidate debates, you know, it's, where was that? Over a dozen candidates. And, and just days later, Ben Carson was interviewed at NBC at Meet, Meet the Press, and he was asked, should a president's faith matter? And this was Carson's reply. If it's inconsistent with the values and the principles of America, of course it should matter, he said. But if it fits within the realm of America and consistent with the Constitution, no problem. It was a safe answer, almost. But the NBC anchor, they're trained to not be put off, he followed up by asking, do you think Islam is consistent with the Constitution? He was asked. And to that, Carson replied candidly, no, I do not. I would not advocate putting a Muslim in charge of this nation. He said, I absolutely would not agree with that. You see, a poll says that 30% of Americans believe that the sitting U.S. President Barack Obama is Muslim. And so, not surprisingly, a firestorm erupted out of that. And almost on cue, CNN, as its anchors, very quickly let their biases show. Following their lead, they, they interviewed those who very quickly began to undermine Ben Carson. Soon after the initial bloodletting, the name calling began. Carson has since been called an Islamophobe, a dangerous religious fanatic, and then a string of slanderous attack. One commentator was enraged that Carson, who is an eminent pediatric neurosurgeon, is on record that he sa by saying that he doesn't believe in evolution. And two, putting one words into, into his mouth, one commentator was outraged that Carson would exclude atheists from seeking the U.S. presidency. Well, he never said such a thing, but he might have uh, if he was asked, but he was not. But then, the supreme insult on primetime CNN, one commentator venomously hissed, he's a putz, he's a Bible thumper, he said. Now, I understand Islamophobe, you know, it's civilized slander. One easily and quickly thrown at anyone you strongly disagree with. In our days, calling someone a something-phobe has become an urbane, supposedly polite way of ridiculing his opinions. For example, because of my views on homosexuality, I've been called a homophobe again and again. It's usually followed by a lingering and patronizing smile when I'm told that. Well, I thought too that you couldn't get much worse than being called a Bible thumper. After all, it's meant to evoke images of the fallen televangelists of the late 1980s. But I thought wrong. I wasn't quite sure what putz meant. Other than it came very dangerously close to our own profanity that started out with the same three letters. And so I looked it up. And sure enough, it was slang that said much of the same thing of our own cuss words. It means fool, it means idiot. But it wasn't just that, I soon discovered. I had to Google the word. It wasn't in any of my digital dictionaries. And I discovered that putz is extra vulgar slang. The kind of slang that's not used in polite society. It comes from that notoriously sexually explicit 1934 book by Henry Miller, The Tropic of Cancer. It translates into a five-letter word that I really don't much care to repeat here. When we were giving each other feedback about a couple of weeks ago, giving, keeping our preaching honest, our teaching honest, the, the leaders and I, you know, I learned the Chinese versions from Pastor George. Ah, uh, ang umpisa niya, bo. Pero pinangako, KJ ito eh, sabi niya, huwag mo na uulitin, lalo na sa palpit. Kaya, bo ang umpisa. Hulaan niyo na lang kaya kung ano ibig sabihin. Well, here's the thing. I watched the last big presidential debate, Republican presidential, presidential debate on TV. And very clearly, Ben Carson was underwhelming in that debate. But there was one thing that I found quite remarkable about Ben Carson. The reason he came, in, came on as so unimpressive in that debate is this. Unlike the others, he was determined not to be dragged into the strategy of insults, of constant character attacks, and the name calling that catapulted Donald Trump to the top of the ratings. Again and again, he deflected provocation to do that and instead got into the underlying issues. And my friends, that strategy just simply doesn't play out well in a world of TV sound bites that places great value on aggressiveness, 
on biting repartee, on innuendos, and on half-truths. A world where a hideous man like Donald Trump has made outright slander an art form. A strategy that catapulted Trump to the top of the Republican A-list. Well, we all don't know much about his religious convictions, Carson. A write-up I found said he was a devout Christian. It also said he was a renowned neurosurgeon. He stands squarely against abortion and dismisses evolution like most of us do. He sounds like someone who understands what it means to be an alien, a stranger, a sojourner in this world. But even so, we don't know exactly where Carson's faith lies. Evidently, however, what he said against Muslims in the White House and his conservative Christian views was all of the provocation needed to trigger a vicious all-out slander and character assassination. My friends, that's a real-life situation we face today. And not surprisingly, Peter, looking out through the ages, through these later days of ours, addresses himself to this very thing in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Peter's immediate objective was to fortify his readers, his first century readers, to the similarly escalating hostility and animosity that was breaking out among them. Let me ask you, what forms of excellent behavior might the ungodly find threatening and offensive? So threatening and so offensive that it might go them to heap slander upon our very persons. Well, in the days that we live in, there are many. Firstly, we I may expect to see a reaction, even false accusations, even lawsuits from exercising church discipline. Grace Community Church, uh, John MacArthur's church in Panorama City, someone actually walked almost straight up to uh, John MacArthur while he was preaching and, and started, um, you know, heckling him about this very thing. You know, he disagreed with him and, and said, you know, I don't agree with you on, on cessationism and, and many other things. You know, in, in Des Moines, Iowa, where my son P.D. has a, attends a, he's one of the leaders now in a small and quiet church, only 100 or so people. Nice, friendly people, it seemed to me. I was shocked when they told me that they actually have a marshal with a firearm in the worship service every Sunday, looking for such a disruption like this. And then to our, consider our views on sexual morality, you know, and they certainly are becoming more and more offensive and threatening to a world that is turning more and more immoral. You know, uh, one of the things that my son faced when he moved to the United States, you couldn't spank a child out in, in public because you're liable to get uh, called out by the police. You know, as we close, my friends, tonight, that today, as Peter intended, I remind you all, I remind myself, we are citizens of heaven. We are not citizens of this world. We are aliens, strangers, mere sojourners in this world. There is no such thing as dual citizenship in matters of faith. Either you are a citizen of the world or you are a citizen of heaven. We have each of us been handpicked, elected by the Father himself. Our souls have been purified so that the lusts that wage war against our souls cannot and will not prevail. Our souls have been purified by the Son. Our souls continue to be purified by His Spirit. We are each of us handpicked, guarded, protected, and empowered by the Godhead itself, the triune Godhead. And my friends, many today who call themselves Christians worship in the Trinity of the world. You know what the Trinity of the world is? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the worst of the lot, that which compromises your soul even as it renders you blind and deaf to correction, the boastful pride of life. But my friends, we can all do something about this. We have been handpicked by God himself. We have been called, we have been given everything necessary for life and godliness. You know, and no matter what the world around us does, we can always fall back on that. 
We all need to know that we will be slandered. This coming week, I have the opportunity to do something, to live an excellent life in the midst of that. Your leaders and I have been slandered, and I have an opportunity to correct that, but my, my brief from the Word of God, from this passage, is to do that in an excellent way. I pray you will pray for me, you will pray for us as we weather this storm coming. And our hope is that you will also rise to that occasion as citizens of the kingdom when your opportunity comes to do that. And believe you me, it will come. Prepare to be slandered because you are aliens, strangers, citizens of the kingdom, not of this world. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you. We praise you for your brief yet pithy words to us. I pray that we have somehow done justice to this short passage and yet it is so meaty and so speaks to all of us. I pray that you would give us strength, courage to stand our ground, to fight against the fleshly lusts, that wage war against our souls. Thank you that we can do that through you and that you have get all of the glory whatever happens. Thank you. Just keep us all in the center of your hand, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.